What's up, guys? Welcome back to my channel. I'm Bryce, and today I'm going to be reading chapter 12 of the Parker Inheritance. Let's begin. Chapter 12, Enoch Washington, 1914 through 1940. As fast as Enoch, his father, and his brother worked, it still took them a month to finish seizing Mr. Tidwell's farm during that spring of 1914, which meant they lost a month planting their own cotton, which meant their crop didn't have enough time to mature before it was time to harvest. Come to the end of the season, their hall was light again, placing them further in depth than Mr. Tidwell. This continued for the next five years, Enoch and his family planting their landowners' crops before tending their own. And Enoch grew taller and broader with each season. By the time he turned 11, he towered over the, over the other kids his age. He could hit a baseball farther and round the bases faster than anyone else at his school, and he could haul more cotton than two of his older brothers. It was also at 11 that he got into his first fist fight. His father noticed the large welt on Enoch's face, but didn't speak of his bruise at first. Five days after the fight, he took his son to the edge of the plot to repair a fence. They started at dawn, pulling up the old rotten wood and digging new, deeper holes to anchor the post. It wasn't until the afternoon that his father asked, So when are you going to tell me that fight was about? And don't lie to me. I already talked to Cordell Rackley, your teacher, about it. Enoch had gotten into a fight with a boy named Sammy. The boy with his slim build and golden brown skin was the splitting image of his father, Cordell Rackley, the man who oversaw all the colored workers on Mr. Tillwell's land. Mr. Rackley may have had more money, power, and status than any other colored man in Lillane, but his children were only allowed to attend a one-room Negro school like every other colored child in the county. Enoch shook the dirt from his shovel. I bet Sammy to a race. First one to the pole, to the flag pole, and back. If I won, I'd get the slice of cake in his bag. If he won, he'd get my ham sandwich. You wagered a ham sandwich against a piece of cake? W wagered. You wagered. My bad. Keep messing the word up. Boy, you know how much that meat is worth. I knew I would. I knew I could beat him, and I did. Enoch started digging another hole, but Sammy said I cheated. Then he swung at me, so I hit him back. Your your teacher said you started it. I didn't. She's just saying that because of who Sammy's daddy is, she's always treats him better than everybody else. His father sighed. Yeah, you're, you're probably right. That's why you got to be smarter than the Sammy Rackleys of the world. Work harder. He called me names, too. Enoch leaned against his shovel and said I was named after a slave. Enoch didn't want to admit that the comment would have bothered him less if it had come from anyone else other than Sammy. I named you after your granddaddy, the last slave in this family, which means he was also the first free man in this family. His father wiped the sweat from his brow with the threadbare rag. And if you ever learn to keep your mouth shut and ears open, you might be the first college-educated man in this family, Enoch Brown. Pa? You're hard-headed, but you're smart. You can read better than any of us. And the way you do those numbers all in your head, Enoch's father looked down at his son. Enoch was still shorter than him, at least for another couple of years. Your Aunt Dorothy lives in Birmingham. There's a school for coloreds there. It's good, too, according to your aunt, he nodded as if he was convincing himself. I've already talked to your mama about it. You'll leave at the end of the school year. What about the crop? Enoch asked. You need my help picking the cotton. What, and what about Mama? And Jasper and Simon and we'll manage. We always do. Enoch's father returned his rag to his back pocket. Not a word of this to your brothers and sister. Understand? I'll tell them myself in time. But why me? Because you got a chance, a real chance, of being something other than a sharecropper. Your brothers and sisters are strong. Good workers. But they don't got what you got. He tapped his son's forehead. Just don't waste it. 
And don't go off trying to challenge everybody that looks at you the wrong way. You're a colored man in the South. You don't have to go searching for a fight. It'll come to you on, all on its own. Enoch left for Birmingham a few months later. His aunt Dorothy, his grandmother's youngest half-sister, was a secretary at one of the churches. She helped Enoch acclimate to living in the big city in the noise. Since the noise, the buildings, the vehicles, and the people were all new to him. She also worked with him so she could catch up with his classmates. At this new school was much more challenging than the grade school he left behind. She taught him how to wash his own clothes and cook his own food. She protected him as he grew from a boy to a man. One thing that didn't change was Enoch's dislike for his name, especially as other kids continued to tease him about it. So when he tried out for the baseball team at his new school and one of the kids asked him about what his name was, he said, call me Washington. Enoch shared his last name with another boy on the team, so the players, baseball players called him Big Washington to differentiate the two. Eventually, the shortened to Big W by the name he started college at Tuskegee Institute. Enoch had become Big Doug while he excelled at baseball, football, and track. The sport he enjoyed the most was tennis. It was an elegant sport, far removed from the cotton fields and outhouses of his youth. He liked that he didn't need to depend on anyone else to win a match. It was just him against his opponent, one man fighting another, one man fighting against another for dominance. He quickly mastered the game, eventually giving up for baseball for it. After graduating with a degree in mathematics, Big Doug moved north, where he spent the next few years teaching at Mall Colored schools in Virginia and Maryland. Returning to Lilling or Birmingham was never a consideration as both his parents and aunt passed away while he was in college. He tried to maintain contact with his siblings, but they had migrated to Chicago and New York, and he moved from place to place. Their letters became less frequent. Before he knew it, three years had passed without word from any of his family. Big Dub eventually met a young school teacher named Leanne Diggs, but she was smart and beautiful with eyes that could captivate a room and sweet potato pies that were the best in the county. He liked that Leanne came from a cultured family. Her father, an educated man, was a publisher of a small Negro newspaper. Her family had been free since the early 1800s and even owned land. But he also courted Leanne for another more strategic reason, her smooth, light brown skin. As Enoch had come to learn, the brown paper bag test was a way for a life of a, for a Negro. The fairer you were, the better you were treated, and the more power you were allowed to have. With his dark skin and thick, kinky hair, Enoch knew he'd never be seen the same as his peers, but that didn't have to be the case for his sons. A year after they were married, a former classmate contracted Enoch about a job at Perkins High School in Lambert, South Carolina. Enoch didn't want to move back to the Deep South, but the school promised to let him both teach and coach. He would serve as an assistant football coach, and he would be allowed to form his own tennis team. Five years after that, Leanne had the last became pregnant with what would be the couple's only child, though they didn't know that it, though they didn't know that yet. Big Doug spent every night with his ear pressed to his wife's stomach, listening to the movements in her belly. A group of his fellow teachers wagered on how large the child would be, and even took the call on the baby little Doug. In May of 1940, Enoch and Leanne Washington welcomed an 8-pound, 22-inch infant into the world. Big Dub had been hoping for a son, but it only took a second for him to fall in love with his baby girl. She had to inherit her mother's fair skin or fine hair, but Dub didn't care. She was perfect. What should we name her? Leah asked as she rocked the child to sleep. And don't you dare say little Dub. Enoch knelt beside his wife and took the baby's small, brown, wrinkled hand in his. You should name her, Leanne thought for a few moments. What about Siobhan? After my Irish grandmother. And I reckon you want to keep that silly spelling. Of course, she said. Strange names run in our family, Enoch. <laughs> Siobhan it is, he said. He kissed his daughter's forehead, but she'll always be a little dub to me. 
And that was chapter 12. So tomorrow I'll be reading chapter 13. And uh, that's about it. Peace out.